and welcome back to Fully Equipped. Joel, RB, Sarah Pillar, Uncle Gene, whole crew. Boys, are we doing another late night edition of Fully Equipped? What could go wrong? Another late night after hours adventure. What I look forward to all week. I'm delirious. I'm going to I'm gonna for sure say some stuff tonight that'll uh, get, get bleeped, guaranteed. Well, where are you at this week, Jaywall? I I'm at uh I'm at Arnie's place. I'm at Bay Hill. And there was a lot going on today at Bay Hill. I'm gonna get to it. Also did an interview for the podcast that's coming up. It's gonna be a fun one. I don't wanna say the names. I always do. I always blow it and then nobody listens. So I I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna holster it. But it was a good interview. Tour pro. The, may, maybe a, tour, a tour player and, and someone else that might be related to them. So we'll uh, we'll tease that. <laughs> you're 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 already giving it away, RB. Come on, man. What? Well, what you get? Do you get Dustin it. Johnson and his brother as caddy? I don't know. Maybe you did. I'm not. <laughs> maybe, we, Claire got, maybe, got maybe. DJ and yeah, Pauline on the true. scoop. Who yeah, knows? Yeah. I'm not. I'm, I'm, just I'm not that cool. I don't have that kind of clout. All right. I think Gene's the only one that could pull that down. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, that's 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 not my end of the pool. I, I, I'm I'm merely an observer. <laughs> well, where are we starting tonight? So last week was way more buttoned up. We did. If you, if you didn't listen to last week's episode, please go back and listen. I don't implore people to go back and listen to an episode of this podcast unless it's really good. Last week's was really good. Got, I don't know about you guys, but I received a ton of really positive feedback on our driver robotic insights episode, 90 minutes. It was it was awesome. Yeah, oh yeah, by the way, you can watch or listen. So you don't have to you don't have to just do Spotify or Apple iTunes or however you consume your podcast content. Go check out our YouTube cha- uh YouTube page, YouTube channel, YouTube page, whatever. YouTube change. There we go. <laughs> I told you this is going to be a really terrible episode. It's already going off the rails. <laughs> but go check out the Fully Equipped Golf YouTube page. We have last week's episode up there and all the rest of the uh, the most recent episodes of the podcast, plus all of the Robotic Inside videos that we shot with myself and RB, Uncle Gene, Serial Killer. So go check those out as well. Where, where do we want to start this week, boys? This I'll be honest. I, I got, had I got very low. I know where I want to start. Oh no! I'm going to cut you right off there, Jaywall. Oh no! Because you tech, oh, you no. mentioned this to me. You mentioned this to <laughs> no. me earlier. And like we could we could touch on Scotty's putter. We'll get to that in a second. But I think this is a really interesting trend because I've noticed this as well in my recent weeks on tour. I'm sure Chris has noticed uh, we were, as well. We were going to get to this, but yeah, let's let's kick it off. And having players in there, but mm-hmm. the. Is you know like the death of the salesman? Like, is there going to be the eventual death of the the on-site tour rep or the amount of tour reps that exist? Because you noticed a very interesting trend this week. And again, like I said, this is a through line through the, like a lot of this season, I would think so far. And that is a lot of players are coming prepared and they're really not visiting the vans anymore. Yeah, this this is going to be a story and I'm just kind of waiting to see if it just continues or or if this is an aberration, but I think I think it is a definitely a trend. As Arby mentioned, he and I have been out on tour the early part of this year, and without fail for the last – I can't believe I'm saying this – for the last like decade plus that I've been covering equipment on the PGA Tour, you can hang your hat on equipment changes occurring in January and February without fail, except this year. I don't know what is going on, but it is weird. That I, I don't know if it's the whole live situation without you know Bryson and his million you know million changes and DJ changing putters every week, but we it's quiet. And th- this was the very first week where I spoke to three different reps independently at different times uh, during the day, and they all told me the same thing which was, man, it's quiet out here. There's not a lot of changes going on. And uh, my ears perked up. But the third guy, you've got three guys telling you the same thing. Um, Something else that was interesting, some of these reps are, and it's it's more on like the component side, so not like the major manufacturers, but we're talking 
like the the shafts and grip kind of guys they're not getting intel <laughs> with their changes like there there were some changes that that went down last week at pj national for the cognizant and i spoke to reps this week trying to get some intel and they're like man i found out the same time you did like i got a text from somebody like hey so and so made a change to the to the driver shaft or put in or added a new putter grip so there there's a disconnect right now out, out on the PGA tour between the the reps and some of the reps and some of the the bigger OEMs and as RB mentioned yes there there are players that now seem to be doing a lot more of their testing at home and they're doing it with their instructors and reps are sometimes coming in town to do the testing one rep I'm, I'm I will not I will not name names because a, a lot of this is told um without me using names but one of them said that they could see in the next like five to ten years a similar situation to live now i don't think it's going to get to be that extreme out on live they have uh, an equipment truck now they do have some reps from some of the big brands out there now but you know they pretty much have like one big truck the tour van that services a lot of guys needs out on live I don't know, man. That seems really extreme to have all the major OEMs not have trucks out there. I don't think it's going to get to that point. But I do think that we could see a point where there is maybe fewer reps out on tour. And and that's disappointing because there's a lot of, there are a lot of great characters and and a lot of really good guys. A lot of those reps are awesome, but I don't know. This has been this has been a weird year so far and we're we're just at the beginning of March. Chris, do man, you think I can this is something see Oh, Go you're ahead, gonna, RB. If you're gonna chime saying? in anyway. You're gonna chime in anyways. I'm gonna set you up. But like, um, do you find Team that, me up? Like, I love it. Be, being in an area where there are a lot of like touring professionals, and you see a lot of them come through, like True Spec Studios and stuff like that. Do you find that there's there's like there is a team around when they're doing this that are that are outside of the OEMs, whether it be like a coach or someone else involved, or is it them doing the independent testing on the side, and then? kind of saying like, this is what I'm going to bring to the event. And then like, they're kind of set, like, how does that work? Because to me, I feel like coaches are getting a lot more involved and we've seen this not to transition intentionally eventually, but like we've seen this with like Scotty Scheffler and his putter, like there's seven people sitting around him when he's trying different putters. And I'm like, it seems like a lot, but you know what teach their own. I mean, honestly, it really kind of depends on the player. I mean, I've seen a little bit of, everything so i mean i've seen guys that come on their own that don't want anybody else's opinion except an unbiased fitter and their own eye and feel and then i've also seen guys that literally come in with an entourage and all i'm doing is basically it turning a wrench and handing clubs and shafts to the player and i maybe say 10 words and a couple hour session and just kind of offer my two cents when I'm asked. But I, uh, out of all the years of doing this, I, I know when, when my opinion is wanted and when it's better to just, uh, be quiet and hand off a golf club to a coach or a uh, team of coaches or just a player and wait for feedback. So, I mean, I would, I would have to agree that there is a trend happening as it's been quiet for, you guys witnessing tour cha- or uh, gear changes out on tour, but I mean, the amount of guys that I have had reach out and request to do some testing, I, I'm going down to our, our talking stick facility the, the day that this goes live and doing some testing with another player that is a little curious about some gear, but doesn't necessarily want any exposure for doing that testing. So I think the brand agnostic environment and the independent testing facilities and, you know, fitters that are versed in a variety of different gear and equipment options are probably going to be more present, I would say, rather than just the independent tour reps that we're accustomed to seeing. Because, I mean, guys are figuring out they have one solid week with the right equipment that fits them, regardless of the manufacturer, and they're going... Yeah, this uh, this eclipses the entire paycheck I'm getting from insert OEM staff deal. So it's uh, it's definitely shifting a little bit, and I don't think we're going to see the demise of the tour rep, but definitely the presence of you know hounding guys on the on the T line to to try this, try this, try this. That's probably going to take a backseat. Yeah, 
it's it's it is interesting times. Uh, but the reps still do have value out on, out on the PJ Tour, and and it was it was on display this week. Let's start with Scotty Scheffler. Why why not? We were going to bring him up anyway. Uh, so I, I showed up to the putting green this morning at Bay Hill. Scotty's bag was there. There were some some tailor made folks milling around, and I saw him taking pictures of of the putter. I look over at the putting at uh, the putter cover. It's a black tailor made putter cover, and you start you start putting like two and two together, and it's like okay. Well, I guess I guess the the Olsen experiment, at least for the moment, the Olsen experiment is being put on hold. And lo and behold, there's there's your your spider spider two or X butter. So um, I posted pictures of it. Now, I, I got to say, it is pretty funny when I post stuff on social media. And and this one took off pretty quickly, mostly because of two things. One, Scott is using a mallet and people get excited about that. And two, because Scotty has a beard again. And everybody's like, ah, oh, Scotty's going to win by seven this week. He's got the beard back and he's got a mallet putter. And everybody's like, finally, a mallet putter. I, I don't, I mean, maybe there are people out there that don't follow gear as closely as we do but scotty used the mallet putter less than a year ago he used he was a tailor-made spider tour proto putter at the at the fedex st jude and i mean it was it was a pretty big news because he had just been using camerons so this is not anything new now i think the reason why this is a bigger deal is because rory mcelroy came out recently uh during his post round and he was asked by Amanda Renner from CBS after Scotty had missed a little, you know, ten footer, and seemed pretty ex- exasperated with it. Asked him, like, "Well, you know, you've struggled with the putter. Like, what what do you do in a situation?" And Rory basically said, "You know, I tell him to to use a mallet. You know, we're all grateful that he's not he's not putting well right now because it helps us out. But yeah, I'd, I'd suggest a mallet. And lo and behold, he's now using the exact same spider that Rory's using." So, you know, everybody thinks that Rory was the impetus behind the change. I don't think that's it. I think I think really Scotty's just – he's still looking, and he just decided to give a spider another shot this week. I, I, I just like to thank – I know he's – maybe he's out there listening. Maybe he's not. I don't know. But I'd just like to thank Scotty if you're out there. I'd like, you to, I'd like to say thank you for taking my suggestion on trying a smaller putter grip. <laughs> Um, I'm sure I was. I'm sure I was probably one of like the only person on the whole internet that probably mentioned that. So I would like to take credit for that at this time. Um, obviously, that I'm being extremely facetious, but I am like so interested to see because Bay Hill is a tough golf course. It is a fairways and greens golf course. There's a lot of rough. He's one of the, he's like literally one of the best drivers and ball strikers in the game. So to see how this comes together this week with a new putter is going to be extremely interesting. Now, I'm sure he's gone through a bunch of different iterations of that putter with a different grip or a different grip on the same putter he had before. I'm sure there's like, again, the decision tree is probably enormous and he had the opportunity to try all of them. So the fact that he brought this to the tournament and this is the one that he's got in the bag, I'm just very curious to see the results altogether because look, I don't, I don't really, I don't say that I would not, I don't, I don't cheer against players. And I cheer against success and I cheer again, like I cheer, sorry, I cheer for success. I cheer for people to be exceptional at like a sport, regardless. And if he gets rolling, like I'm excited to watch that. Like it'd be very interesting to see what this does to like competition on the PGA tour. And like, you know, who else is going to step up different parts of their game to have to compete with Scotty, who's basically put everything else together except his putter. Yeah. And you've got some big tournaments coming up, which is exciting. You've got the Players' Championship next week. Arby's going to be on site for that. And then, oh, by the way, less than a month later after the Players, you have the Masters. So, uh, yeah, I agree. I think if, if Scotty could get the putter going, that would be big. Some of the some of the changes, Arby mentioned one of them, smaller putter grip. He is in the Golf Pride Pro Only Green Star. It's kind of more of the kind of like pistol shape. And – he also is going away from with the proto version. He had a milled face. Now he's back into just more of your traditional like Serlin aluminum pure roll insert. And the other change that I noticed it, more of like the nerdy side of me. I'm sure RB saw it as well. Serial killer probably did too. 
if you look at photos from August that we photographed of of Scotty's original, the original proto, you'll notice that there were no the TSS weights that you can see towards the back of the head. Those TSS weights were not visible. I don't think that they were there because Scotty wanted that mallet to perform more, more like a blade. So he wanted he wanted more face rotation. He shifted a lot more of that weight towards the front of the putter with that milled face. And from what I can see, and you guys can tell me if you if you think that I'm off, but I, I see the TSS weights more towards kind of centrally, but maybe a little bit more towards the back, like the retail version. And like I think this to me looks like he's using a stock, a stock spider two rex. So maybe he's trying a like full on mallet this time to see what happens instead of just trying to find a mallet that performs like a blade. There's, there's definitely a change there. And I'm that this is, this is again, like that decision tree of like pulling levers of like what, what you're going to try to go from the, the blade to the previously, like the mallet that kind of performs like a blade, which for players out there who are curious, you can go find an FCG spider from like two years ago, which has the copper face, which is really cool. Go give that a shot. They're, they're really cheap online. So if you're really curious, good thing to go check out. Um, but mm-hmm just in general, like this, this change as a whole is a lot going on. So, you know, whether there is failure or success, what comes down to it at the end of, if you're like going through like an experimentation process is what is your, like, what are the variables here? And there's a lot going on. So it's going to be interesting to kind of figure out, and this is where ShotLink doesn't do a great job. And I know that they're trying to do a better job of this, but like, is there bias in his right or left miss, right? Is he missing like overly long? Is he missing overly short? And so when you look at statistics and his strokes gained putting, there's one thing to say like, yeah, he hasn't putted well, but like, where are his misses? And are they uphill, downhill, side hill? Like where are they breaking? All of these different things. And so I know I understand it from what I've heard from, from a lot of people, like they are working on trying to better understand all of these data points so they can really input them to help golfers even, you know, further break down, all these different elements, but how this, again, just from a curiosity perspective, I do think that, you know, to John, to your point, yes, I believe that it is just very, very close to like a standard retail putter. I'm sure Bucky Co. shout out, you know, we just talked about tour reps in the beginning of it. I'm sure Bucky had a lot to do with that putter. These guys, the spider master out there on tour. And uh, I'm very curious to see how this ends up because I'm, I want to see it. Like, I'd love to see like, a Rory Scotty duel coming down the stretch playing two of the, well, I mean, 17 and 18 are two pretty difficult holes on the PGA tour. They're well known. A lot of people know them and it'd be fun to watch that go down. I mean, that is just the, the perfect case scenario there to watch those two guys on, uh, on Sunday coming down the stretch. There'd be a lot of people tuning in to see that. I'm sure which I mean, isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the, the PGA tour has, uh, has been taken, taking a little bit of heat lately with uh, the leaderboards and who's in the field and who's not in the field. So a, uh, a Rory and Scotty showdown on Sunday at Bay Hill, that would be phenomenal. I mean, they need it. Let's yeah, let's, let's put the bets in in Vegas right now. Let's do it. Now, uh, before we move on to the next topic, Jonathan, you'd kind of mentioned this, and I think it's important is like, you know, th- this week is Arnold Palmer. Next week is the players coming up. We've obviously got a very important tournament uh, in Augusta. After that, got the PGA. But the one after that is the U.S. Open at Pinehurst. <laughs> a little bit further down and the road. <laughs> a little bit further down the road. But, you know, we got to build some type of transition in here some way. There we go. And I like for it. those who are inside golf members, if you haven't heard of Inside Golf, it's our membership program called Inside Golf, where you get a ton of benefits, like first off, a dozen strikes on golf balls, 20 bucks to spend at Fairway Jockey, and a subscription to Golf Magazine, which also includes the all of the uh, web website content and something I posted about before, the backlog of golf.com issue, or golf magazine issues, which you can access through golf.com, which are loaded with all kinds of if you're into equipment, you could go back and look at old club test issues, which are a lot of fun, which, you know, for you golf geeks out there, I mean, I delved into them for quite a while and just all kinds of instruction articles and all kinds of stuff. But anyways, 
when you are a member of this, you also get access to something that's really cool, which you're doing right now, which are bucket list experiences. And our first one is at Pinehurst. It's a three day, two night adventure at Pinehurst, which is just two weeks before the US Open. And the trip includes a round of golf on number eight, the newly opened number 10, and a behind the scenes walkthrough of number two, which is hosting the aforementioned US Open. So you get to do that with members of the golf.com team, golf magazine team, and you're gonna get inside knowledge of the golf course, inside look at the golf course, and walking the same ground that the leaders will be walking down on Sunday, which is very, very cool as well. You're also going to get an uh, exclusive tour of the new World Golf Hall of Fame and the USJ Museum. And again, we love you club nerds out there. Um, I hope you love us too. And you also get to see the USGA Club Testing Center, which I've never seen. So hopefully I get to go and see this whole thing too. So go to golf.com slash Pinehurst Experience to book your spot now. And for Inside Golf members, you do get $1,000 off the original price. So again, go to golf.com slash Pinehurst Experience to get all the information on this really cool event and check it out there and book your spot. I don't know if Uncle Gene's going to make it back on this podcast tonight. <laughs> He is it's, definitely having some some technical difficulties. There he is. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm back. Of the devil. There he is. Is. Oh, he's back. His internet is crap in the bed tonight, but it's good to see it's him not back. My, it, yeah, I'm back. Not he's back. Uh, all right. So the only thing you missed was a talking super about sweet ad read. So <laughs> no, yeah, you missed you missed a great uh, a great transition into an ad read from RB. Damn, I, I, yeah. I really enjoy this. <laughs> but you know, you know, Gene, here's the thing. If you head over to YouTube and go to the fully equipped uh, YouTube page, channel, whatever you want to call it, you can watch the whole YouTube thing. YouTube change, live. as I call it. I didn't, yeah, see, I didn't say that. I got, I got both of them right. So anyway, anyways, let's get back to Let's get back to this whole thing. All right. Okay. Oh, uh, by the yeah. way, hey, shout out to everybody watching this on YouTube. Thank you. You guys have done uh you've done us a big solid and uh uh what, what were the numbers jay wall for last week's uh episode <laughs> there were fifteen thousand people watched the episode that is so awesome to look at our uh, four ugly mugs listen to us <laughs> ramble about golf clubs thank you thank and you some people actually so many people actually watched the entire 90 minute episode wow <laughs> it's a crazy they were just is... waiting for a a it's crazy warranty outburst. I guarantee. You. <laughs> nah, I, I kept it together. I kept it so, tight. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't go sideways last week. All right. So a couple of things that uh, that caught my eye. Um, this this goes right back to this this trend that we're seeing. We we talked about the, last week that the Taylor Taylor made QI10, the core model, because people keep asking, "Are you talking about the LS?" The core, like which one? I'm talking about the core model, your your standard QI10. This is the driver that we've seen Rory use. We've also seen Adam Scott use. Who else is using QI10 now? Mr. Brooks Kepka. Mr. Brooks Kepka. There you go. So there are a lot of guys that are that are finding the that kind of middle of the road driver from TaylorMade to be a good fit. And I bring this up because. Ricky Fowler, I was watching him today on the range, and he and, and Cobra Tour at Ben Showman. Ben Ben is one of the best dudes on the PGA Tour, uh, one of the smartest guys. But he's just just a just a fun guy to to chat with. He and he and Ricky were working on drivers, and I kid you not, I my head was spinning because Ben pulls out two heads, and these things have about five to six massive strips of lead tape all over the sole. And then one strip of lead tape on the top of the crown. And I got my camera there and I'm clicking away. And I'm like, holy crap. They are working on something big. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. And so they finish up like an hour later. I was there watching it the whole time. They kept hitting drivers. Ben would make a little tweak to the lead tape. And he gets done. And I'm like, hey, Ben, what's going on, man? What, what What's the deal with Ricky's driver? Is it a new driver this week? He's like, no, yeah, he put in a new driver last week at the Cognizant. But it's tough to tell, man, because – the the dark speed driver heads other than the little bit of color change you can't really tell it's it's not like you know the qi10 stuff where you can you can see a little bit more on the sole and and kind of differentiate the, the driver heads it's it's tough now i know the weight the weight locations are a little bit different on the cobras but it's still difficult even for your boy 
who, who spends way too much time on Getty images. And so Ben told me an interesting story that he two weeks ago started working with Ricky on, on Cobra dark speed X. Now Ricky was in the LS product, but he was having trouble keeping it on the map. And it, it showed in his numbers. He was a hundred and like 67th in stroke scan off the tee and like in the one forties in, in driving accuracy. And so they, they, Basically, Ben showed up. He had four heads, uh, went to Metalist. They did some work, and they found a nine-degree head with a brand-new Project X Denali Black 70TX shaft. So he's going away from that really sweet uh, Mitsubishi Diamana whiteboard, the one with like the custom etching in it, the prototype. He's going away from that. The Denali found the that shaft and the, the X head to be a much better fit. And Ben said... Simply like, look, these guys aren't perfect. Like they're going to miss. And for Ricky, he misses more out on the toe. And because of that, we're trying to find a driver that's going to not like want to shoot left and something that's going to keep spin and just stay on the map. And that's what they found with the X is it's more forgiving. And like, oh, by the way, I mean, the numbers, he said from a spin perspective, pretty similar to the LS, but it's just more forgiving. And we're we're seeing it, guys. We're seeing more players out on the PGA Tour going away from the LS heads into these slightly more forgiving. As Gene mentioned last week on the the Robot Insight Pod, you know, a lot of these drivers are still low spin, so you're able to get that that beautiful combination of of more forgiveness with low spin. And that's what Ricky was working on was just trying to find that driver. The ones that he was working with. With Ben, those were backups. And I think this is kind of a cool story, and it's very inside baseball, but hey, this is a gear podcast, so what the heck. But Ben said that, you know, for a lot of people out there, they know that a hot melt, rack glue, whatever you want to call it, you can add it to the internal portion of the head to change uh, not just the weighting, so you can change shot shape or spin, but you can also change the acoustics. So what Ben does, because adding little bits of hot melt here and there to really dial in a driver is very tedious and requires you to go back and forth to the equipment truck and the the one at Bay Hill is not close, he uses uh, lead tape. And so Ricky will hit the driver and then Ben will talk to Rick and get his feelings on what he's, what he's seeing, what he's feeling, and then he'll just adjust the lead tape. And so by the time he finishes, he has a driver with lead tape in all the right spots. And then when he goes back to the truck, he peels off the lead tape, he measures the tape to get the exact weighting, and then he goes inside the head and he positions the hot melt exactly where that lead tape was located on the outside of the head. Boom, dialed in backup driver, and we're done. So that's what was going on at Bay Hill. Rick has a new driver, it's more forgiving, but um, but yeah, the, the lead tape was just for the backup, but it did get me very excited. Just like uh, uh, Scotty and, and like his putter grip is obviously like a big listener of the podcast. I'm sure uh, I'd like to thank Ben and Ricky and his whole team for listening to our Robot Insights video with Gene and talking about how great that that uh, that Cobra Dark Speed X is, right, Gene? I think <laughs> he on probably that knew miss, it. right? That I think, miss. I think I think you probably knew that about three or four months ago. I'm just gonna guess, but. That X is a great head. I think it's a sneaky good head. We we talked a lot about Cobra's, uh, the Max product, but but that that X I think is going to be a, a really sneaky good head for a lot of golfers. Agreed. This is where I I think this for golfers and like for players who might not be like at obviously like a tour player level. But if you're not ranked in the top 500 in the world, you probably know who I'm talking about. Um, but get this question a lot. I'm sure you do as well, Chris is like, why don't more players use the LS head? And a lot of times my answer to that question is when I get it on social media is their delivery numbers are so good that they do not need to reduce spin. They are looking for consistency in their spin around their misses. Whereas in some cases, higher handicap golfers, even like lower handicap golfers that are obviously not tour players, they might not deliver it as well. So they need that spin reduction to help lower ball flight, flatten ball flight, and also reduce dispersion. You know, put my hand up for that. Like 
I am not a better golfer than a lot of like a, a whole bunch of people, but I generally trend towards the LS head because my delivery isn't great and I tend to miss it low on the face. So I need something that spins lower. Like you can find these LS heads work for players up to like a 12, 15 handicap if they're delivering the club a certain way, right? Uh, there's uh, such a broad spectrum of players that fit in a variety of different product. And I mean, you hit the nail on the head there, RB. It really depends on strike location and angles that the player kind of creates. And if it, to your point, if you're somebody that misses it low on the face versus high on the face, toe side, heel side, coming from the inside, outside, up, uh, I mean, with your angle of attack versus down with your angle of attack, these drivers will respond differently dependent upon your strike location, dependent upon your speed, dependent upon other angles that you as a player deliver the club at. So there's a variety of different, I mean, things that we're looking at to match the shaft, the head with the player profile. So strike location and speed are two of them. Also start line, overall curvature that you see down range, apex height, landing angle. I mean, there's, there's just so many different things that we take into account during a fitting. And I mean, that's one thing that I kind of combat is categorizing golf clubs into certain boxes. And so players have this stigma when they come in that, oh, this is a player's iron. This is a game improvement iron. And you'll see players that have a particular handicap range and they just don't want anything to do with one category or the other because in their mind, they feel like that club doesn't necessarily fit their demographic. And so it's an educational opportunity for me to go, eh, really, it doesn't matter what category this is, quote unquote, grouped in because this really complements what it is that you're doing and also what it is that you're trying to accomplish as a player. So I, I just try and like break people out of these preconceived boxes and go, you know, this is a golf club and this particular golf club does exactly what it is that we're looking for, regardless of how the marketing monster at you know, OEM uh, decides to tell you who it's for and what it does. So, yeah, there's there's all kinds of opportunities there with different types of gear to accommodate different types of players. It's kind of like the um, like we talked, I think the big one was like heel misses, like we those big MOI drivers. We saw that, Gene, like. If you're a he, regardless of how fast you swing the golf club, if you're a heel misser of the golf, like you'd better in most cases end up in like a max product versus an LS product, which is probably better, like higher on the face in general, again, big generalization here, but you're just looking at the, the nine points, like those nine points can direct you in a lot of directions of like what kind of models you should look for. Oh, a hundred percent. And, you know, we saw it, for example, you know, we not to, you know, rehash too much from last week's podcast, but we saw it like with the QI 10, the drop off in distance on the upper third of almost all their models was minimal to none. And um, so if you miss higher on the face and, you know, you you're spinning too much, you're going to um, uh, you're going to you're going to get some, you're going to get some distance out of that and you're not going to lose a lot. That's the crazy thing. So you're going to, you're going to optimize your launch conditions because usually uh, players, you know, that are hitting down on the ball, they're spinning too much, not launching high enough. So if you can get that ball up in the air by hitting it higher on the club face, you're going to launch better and spin less. And really, and, and the crazy part is, not lose that much ball speed or distance even from that off center hit location but the launch and spin characteristics by hitting on the upper third of the face will really maximize that so uh you know more than anything else for the people listening is get fit get on a launch monitor like a foresight gc quad where you can get really good impact location um data find out where your miss is and then listen to these pods listen i mean you guys do great work in really highlighting which drivers perform best at these different locations and so you can start mining the information that we provide once you know what your miss is 
and combine those two and um, get yourself a good driver in the process. That was very nice to compliment us on that information where you're the guy with the freaking robot gene. So thanks a lot. All, all, I, all, I'm, all I'm doing is producing the data. You guys do the artistry and uh, you you weave it together with your fancy words. And, uh, a trained make, monkey could do those articles, Gene. Let's, let's, uh, well, it's nice you know, AI, AI will soon take your job, but let's celebrate it before, go. it, uh, before go. it goes. There we go. Yeah, that's right. AI is coming for my gig. <laughs> Um, anyway, but I do think it is cool to see another player out on the PJ tour using something other than an LS head and, and finding of success in it. Cause as I mentioned, you know, Ricky was in the one sixties in, uh, strokes gained off the tee in the one forties and driving accuracy last week, he was T 41 at the cognizant and you could say, yeah, it's not a great week for Rick, but he was. 31st in strokes gained off the tee and 33rd in driving accuracy for a guy that was in the 160s 140s that's a massive jump and i think that's why he's yep trending upward as rb is showing with his hand i i do i think i think he's trending in the right direction i would not be surprised to see him have i'm not i'm not a a, you know tipster so i can't i can't you know tip the guys in the field that are going to have good weeks but if i was going to pick somebody to have a good week I think Ricky Fowler's going to have a really good week. Everything's coming together. And, and, we know, are definitely to, not to, a gambling podcast. <laughs> Until like FanDuel or somebody else comes along and uh, yeah, then offers can, us some then money. We can, we can, we can be bought. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think it's interesting, you know, to kind of uh, finish up this conversation. It was really interesting. Callaway introduced a, a chart on the performance characteristics of all three well i'm not counting the uh, the fast model but the the three main models and if you looked at the chart it's not handicap specific it's it's more this is the direction this is the launch and spin you know this is the amount of forgiveness and it was just a really interesting chart because uh i think that i and and i'm hoping that this will i don't know i don't know if go away but minimize you know like what's a max what's an x what's you know all of these terms that that suddenly now are becoming kind of like institutionalized they're almost obsolete at this point because you you really just want to have a brand name and then really kind of dive into the performance characteristics of that and I think that the um, the golfer is becoming savvy enough to understand and to look at that and and to really kind of say, hey, what's the performance characteristics of this model versus that model? And I, Callaway was the one who jumped out. The others the others may have similar things. I just haven't seen them. But I thought it was really instructional and informative for the golfer to look at that. And if you look at it objectively, regardless of um, skill or handicap, I think it, it's it's a good roadmap if you look at that and say, okay, what are the weaknesses in my game, and which one of these models could you know best help uh, you know mitigate some of those. Here, here. Just remember, folks, Alex Noren is a top player in the world, and he is the Callaway. You know, you mentioned it, uh, Max D driver. Because if you look at his swing dynamics, he is, and you see him practice that like little move he does all the time. He comes across it. That's his thing. And it helps with his start line and it helps with his spin. He doesn't care what the hell it says on the bottom of it. It does what it's supposed to do. So just just remember that, folks, out there when you're you're headed to do your next fitting. Are you better exactly. than Alex Norton? And that, I'm going to say most or not. But the uh, you got Morikawa coming out of the gate with the uh, the QI10 Max as well. I mean that's a extremely efficient ball striker and uh, driver of the golf ball, and he's playing the most forgiving product in the TaylorMade stable. I mean today was, was. it was yeah was my apologies. At least he had it in play in a PGA he Tour event. He, he did for a hot minute. It was it was a story. And, I had two guys, uh, the MLB players that were in the studio today, both of them swinging, cruising speed, no joke, 125 miles an hour. Uh, and they ended up 
in two very, very different products just because dynamically how they hit the ball and and angles it was that they were producing. And one ended up in a TSR3 with a Tensei White uh, 1K. And it was Ooh. he was playing the 60TX. And then the other ended up in, coincidentally, the Cobra Dark Speed X with a Acra RPG, the 472M5+. Plus. That is a freaking pull. <laughs> so to say, yeah. man, I mean, those, those RPG was a beefy driver build. Aggressive. <laughs> Big, yeah, those, those RPGs, I've I've hit them in like the M, even in like the M4 flex, which is for those like the way that they do their their um their shaft coating for flex is like the standard stiff. It's like that's not as stiff. Like it is. And they have an M. I think they have an M5 no. Plus, don't they? Like for the like, if you're like that, a, like a complete, he, he was in like a monster. Who uses that M5 uses Plus? The plus? Ugh. That's, that's awesome. not my boy today. It's and it's. I think the, in a lot of cases too, it's a it's a feel thing for that player. So they they actually like yeah. they their transition is better, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And the the shaft that he came in the door with was a a stock proprietary. Uh, MCA Kylie Blue 60X and I went, oh no, 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 no. Surprised like, you had to snap is, that. Uh, well, I mean, you should have seen the uh the Delta of Dispersion, and he was playing a a stealth two plus, and uh it was it was not staying in play often, we'll say that. Oh, but man. we got him all dialed in and he was a happy camper and Everybody got new toys and everybody picked up more yardage and uh, check out uh, true spec social story in the next couple days to get a little sneak peek of who it was. Nice. There we go. A little teaser right there. Would, is, is this time of year a big year for like this big time of year for like, you know, a lot of MLB players cause it's been spring training. Chris, is that like, I got, I got an, I, I want some, ins- like seriously, when I say inside baseball, I want some inside baseball golf stuff. Like these guys oh rolling gosh. in like, I need to get fit because oh, I'm on the way, road. Way too, way too late for those gear. kind of jokes. Every year. And it is uh, <laughs> That's awesome. every March specifically. Uh, every March, my, my phone starts to blow up. And hey, man, when you got time? When you got time? When you got time? And it is, uh, it's just kind of kids in the candy store. They get loaded up before they head back home and, and start their regular season. They only get two off days during spring training. So we try, especially the starters, That's like crazy. we try and fit those guys in and accommodate the schedules that they have. And I'll stay late and make sure that they get dialed in. So they're coming in after workouts and after games and make sure that, uh, that they're all set to go for the year. And then, all right, fellas, see you next year. <laughs> wow. This is where you got You got to do like the quick little check of like, okay, well, what's the signing bonus this year? Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I want to make, I want to make sure that we're looking at like the right gear here. <laughs> no, that's I. I don't want them to pay for my time. I have them. I have them just like, hey, you know, sign a ball for me, sign a glove, sign a cleat, sign a bat, something cool. I'm a sign a, sign a swag but... head cover. No, don't touch the covers. <laughs> there we go. Okay, if I'm, uh, if I'm in your city, I want good tickets. That's all. That's what I would want. That's, that would be my. That would be my call. Well, that's just a given. That's a given. All right. Okay. So uh, we're going to get to a couple questions in the hotline this week. But before we do, just want to just a little bit of rapid fire because there were some additional things going on, uh, not just at Bay Hill, but just on tour in general that I, I think are pretty fascinating. Last week, uh, CT Pan removed his Nike Vaporfly Pro 2 iron for a Titleist U505 1 iron. Don't see the 1 iron very often, although it's not a, it's not a traditional 1 iron. Don't get too excited. Uh, but the interesting thing about the change was with CT removing the Nike club, there are now just two Nike clubs left on the PGA tour. That's it. Tony Finau's vapor fly pro and, uh, Justin says, uh, Nike method core putter. And then that's it. And then unless you get a I think it was like Cody Gribble and there's like three or four guys on the corn Ferry that have Nike clubs. And then obviously you've got uh, Brooks Kepka over on Live, but hey, does that really count? I, I don't know. But at least on the PGA Tour, we're almost there. I jokingly said it's it might be time to start writing the obit for Nike golf clubs and professional golf, at least on the PGA Tour. So that I thought that was interesting. Another another one that that caught my eye 
RB noticed this in a video from Liv. Phil Mickelson switched to the new Lab Golf DF3 putter, the the smaller profile version, had his best finish of the year uh, on on the Live Tour. And oh, by the way, another change that completely went uh, under the radar. Nobody noticed it. Phil is in the Mitsubishi MMT iron shafts and wedge shafts. So, yeah, there we go. A little bit of interest there. So he's he's into he's into graphite now. In the irons and the wedges, ten pieces. I was told. Um, other than that, out at Bay Hill, Bettinardi, first time ever, two different iron models. I says this is just like I, I, they have wedges, so it's not that crazy. But uh, they have a a one piece forged cavity back and a one piece forged blade. I was told that Fred Couples has been offering feedback on these. No. No word on if uh, Freddie's going to actually play them, but he is interested, and they're out there. So the we'll see what happens with, when it comes to those. Another guy who is using old gear who is no longer using old gear is Matt Fitzpatrick. He got rid of his Ping S55 irons and is now on a full set of the Ping Blueprint S irons. Those things have been... Um, moving like hotcakes. You see a lot of guys moving into those irons out on the PGA Tour. So um, other than that, I mean, uh, Scotty Cameron had the new Phantom 11 out this week out on tour. They've been slowly releasing those. Oh, and Golf Pride. Hello. Reverse taper. RB did the write-up on the new reverse taper putter grip. That thing's pretty cool. And I found out that that thing has been three years in the making. It's a long time for a putter grip. And uh, they're going to polyurethane with the uh, – with the material on the outside. So a different, a different grip texture and material for them. So there you go. There's kind of your roundup on, on the cool gear. If any of that stuff is turns into larger stories, you know, we're going to cover it more in more detail, but that's sort of the, uh, reader's digest version of what's going on on tour with the gear stuff. So with that, what do you think boys? Do we get into RB? Do you want to say anything or do we get into hotline? I was just going to say, uh, Credit to the Ping engineers, because I can remember when I first saw the the Blueprint S at the Rocket Mortgage last year in the fall or late summer, I guess. So I got like I didn't even get to touch it. I was like basically like, look what I have, no lookies, and then like put it back in the drawer, which is kind of funny. Um, but they said that you know it was called the Blueprint S. It was going to replace a lot of the S series product. Uh, that was their goal when it came to because they knew that there was a lot of players out there with the S55s, basically, and they've done it. And I think that, you know, we we talk so much about goals as far as engineering and design, and they, they saw something that players were sticking with. They wanted to design towards something like that, but that was better. That could be comboed with a blade that was a forged product, and they succeeded. So it's not that I don't think golf club engineers need a big pat on the back. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the players and everyone else around them, you know, sees the goal and sees the success that they have. But I think it is an interesting thing, especially with so many players going to that product. It goes to show that they are making um, substantial developmental steps as far as product is concerned and players are taking notice and they're making changes. And that's why I think it is such a big deal. All right. What do you think? Hotline time? I guess before we get into the hotline, I should probably let you know that if you want to leave us a voicemail for the fully equipped hotline, the number is 602-935-4974. Again, that's 602-935-4974. And we will get to your question, unless it's terrible, then we won't. But if it's reasonably good, I promise you we will we will get to it on the podcast. And with that, Coach, let it rip. We should also note there that if it is over a minute and a half, coach is not going to listen to it. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> so that too. The first, the first guy here left the two minute one, and then another one minute and ten second one back to back, and I'm like, "What's going on?" So I had to dive into it. Um, he explains a story, and he gets his well deserved question into the the pod here. Okay, all right. Hey guys, uh, Patrick from Pittsburgh here. This is my second attempt to make a voicemail. You realize it's hard to keep your 
train of thought when someone tries to cut you off on the highway. But nonetheless, uh, I just got done listening to the interview you had with Aaron Dill, and it made me think. Um, companies like Vokey, you know, wedge manufacturers, have done such a great job of marketing, um, you know, their, their different grinds and the effect that they have, you know, with, with leading edge. And, and obviously, you know, there's different variation of shots with, with the wedges. But I was just wondering, you know, a what is the effect of, of a leading edge and or bounce on irons and B, you know, if there is an effect, uh, you know, why these, these manufacturer, iron manufacturers have not, uh, marketed that. And, you know, you, you'd assume that these pros, you know, they know every little thing about their clubs, uh, you know, whereas, you know, everyday golfers like myself, you know, I, I couldn't tell you the first thing about the leading edge of my irons. Um, so just, just want to pick your brain about that. Love the show. Thanks guys. See ya. Go for it, RB. I, I hope I hope you're Can going I to go it? the same direction that I would have gone. So let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm actually I'm actually curious what you guys are going to say here, um, but I think iron companies like any company that makes an iron and the the different models that they offer, they intentionally design towards certain players and categories. Now I know this is an extreme example and is uh, an example that is uh, a little bit older. But when Jesper Parnovic was still, I think he was, I think he was probably still playing on the, the PJ Tour before he went to the the Champions Tour. He went into a set of Ping G15s, Ping G15s, and from what I was told and what I saw from pictures when they were when he was using them, they were still grinding the leading edge. Because if you ever saw Jesper hit an iron, that man pounds an iron into the ground like few people have ever have in their entire lives. So. They were adjusting bounce. They were adjusting sole. That was a very wide sole iron that was that was intentionally given more uh, leading edge uh, lift, lifting that leading edge off the ground, and creating more uh, bounce towards the leading edge of the golf club. So they are doing it. It's just that they are almost inherently designed into specific iron models that as players make certain swings, they're going to kind of fit into certain models within a company's line. At least that's what I've noticed in almost every case. And, you know, using ping as the example, again, you could be a, a blueprint S player, or you could be a, an I two thirty player because you might need a little bit more balance. You might need a little bit more camber. And it's kind of the same thing through like the tailor product, the Titleist product. It's, it's kind of all through all of these OEMs. It's designed into the the models. It's just that because those models are segmented for certain players, whether they be steep or shallow or kind of a mixture of in between, that's all factored into how those soles are designed. And then after that, there might be slight modifications on the van or in the tour department before they go out to the player. But in most cases, they are they are designed to get to that point. And at least that's that's how I would describe it. But I also know that when it comes to certain players in certain categories, they're going to gravitate towards other models one way or the other, just because of looks and soul width and all that stuff. Did I get that right, Chris? Or what do you, uh, you're sitting there really quiet and I can't tell if you're like, that was good or you're an idiot. He's like, yeah, I think, I think it's the latter. No, not at all. I was waiting to see what <laughs> J wall was going to chime in with is the, I mean, there's no, there's I mean, a mul multitude of ways you can answer that. Yeah, I, all I was going to say was was Vokey actually, especially in the last couple of of iterations for their wedge, they have started to pay attention to the sole width on on the wedges in relation to the iron sets. So they they are making very thoughtful modifications to these clubs with the irons in mind. Um, you know, I, I think I think to like this year with with SM10 they moved the the cg closer to where they are on the the t100s the the cavity back in the in the m or the, the sorry the 620 the mbs and the cbs so the it's it's one of those things where they are being thoughtful in in some of the modifications that they are making to these clubs one thing i will also point out if you go back to a story that i wrote the early part of last year and this was tied to Justin Thomas and Webb Simpson and Adam Scott and then Cameron Young all got custom titles irons. One of the things that titles hinted at 
as they were making this custom irons was that you may down the road, and I don't know when, when that is, it was more of just them hinting that they could potentially have a, uh, a menu of grind options for irons in the future. Something very similar to what they have with Foki. And I wouldn't put them past them because, oh, by the way, RB, we haven't even talked about the with the patent that you posted on social, but Titles is doing some cool shit behind the scenes. So I would not put it past them to have a menu for grind options in the future for irons, just like they do with wedges. Yeah. They're doing some crazy stuff, and uh, if you haven't, I'm not. I'm just. I know. I feel like I feel I'm like the Iron Man driver. This, uh, I, I'm still like. I'm mind blown on on like what I saw there. Yeah, I know we posted on our, our social. You can. I mean, it's very easy to find the whole patent filing online. You just kind of search it out. Uh, but they're. I really liked their 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 little mini documentary on finding feel, talking about irons. Go check it out on YouTube. Again, I wrote, I kind of plugged it. I wrote a little bit, little piece about it. But even as someone who talks, who's had the opportunity to talk to those people, Marty Hines included, like, it's cool to see that stuff and like, see how much work goes into it. And yes, there's cameras following them. And yes, the documentary. And yes, you know, they have the opportunity to edit and make you see what they want you to see. I'm not like, look, I'm not stupid. I've worked in marketing, but actually know that they are doing, they are doing that stuff. Like that is not a lie. That is not some just done for the camera thing like that is really fascinating to watch so if you got 15 minutes or you know you got a little less time and you want to watch it on one and a half speed or whatever it is like go check it out because they are working on these kind of things oems are always working on this kind of stuff and for them to show it off in that way obviously it's self-produced but i mean i still think it is very cool uh go go check it out on the on the titles youtube page and if you're on youtube go check out the fully equipped youtube page as well there we go. All right, Coach, one more. What do we got? We're going to end on a real positive note tonight. This one is oh, no. near and dear to my heart. Just a, a high school coach trying to find ways to maximize the most out of his player season. Hey, guys. Love the podcast. Keep it going. It's great. I just got hired as a high school golf coach. The question I have for you guys is how important is it for a high school golfer who shirts between 45 and 50 to play the same ball the entire golf season. And if it is important, asking for recommendations. I've been told I have almost no budget to acquire golf balls. Thanks, guys. So how important is it to play the same golf ball the entire season? So, I mean, it really kind of comes down to paying attention to essentially what types of shots the player's hitting and also what it is that they're doing around the greens. So you can really dial in a player for a golf ball, watching their approach shots, watching their chip shots, their pitch shots, and how it is that those shots really respond for that particular player. Now, the golf ball is the only piece of equipment that you use tee to green every single shot, every single hole. So I would put a, a pretty high level of importance as far as making sure that the player is using the same golf ball week in and week out. And if there is going to be a golf ball change, that it's a change that is essentially going to be more of a permanent change. And there has to be a reason as to why. So spin and control and consistency coming in and around the greens, that is absolutely what I'm looking for. I fit golf ball from the green backwards. Everything's going to respond essentially for a full swing and off the tee. It's how is that ball responding around the greens for the touch and feel shots. But I, I would rank golf ball as an extremely important piece of equipment to make sure that there's consistency and uniformity there. I mean, RB, I'm, Gene, yeah, what, what's your take on it? Well, I, I was just going to say, you know, as someone who tests a billion golf balls, um, what you want to do with the same golf ball to kind of follow up on your point is you want to eliminate doubt. And so when you know what a golf ball does from a performance standpoint, when you miss hit a shot, you know that was you. you, you're not doubting that it could be the golf ball. If you're switching out golf balls, you you inter, you introduce doubt into the equation, was that the golf ball? 
was that my shot? And especially as a, a formative golfer, a high school golfer, I think it's critical to um, really kind of eliminate that doubt. Now, as far as affordability is concerned, um, what I would recommend is going back to the 2023 golf uh, review, golf ball review that golf.com did. And there's some really good Sirling golf balls out there. So sir, there's two basic categories of golf balls, Sirling golf balls and urethane golf balls. Urethane golf balls are tour grade golf balls. Sirling golf balls are, they can get close to tour grade, but they can also go down to two piece pinnacles. But there are some Sirling golf balls and we tested them last year that really have high performance characteristics, but they don't have the price point that a urethane golf ball has. So um, I, I'd recommend, you know, doing a little bit of mining on that and seeing some more affordable golf balls, um, uh, you know, in the Sirling category, but also realize that go. you want, you want a, um, you want the same golf ball. You really do so that you eliminate that doubt from a player's perspective. I think, I think that's actually like probably the, 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 the most important thing is just consistency. And I think I see it from, I see it from all kinds of players. Like when I just kind of go and teed up with all kinds of random golfers is they will, they will use different golf balls. It's like, Oh, that one checked. And then that one rolled to the green and all kinds of stuff. And you can find, you know, we talk so much about tour performance golf balls, but exactly to Gene's point, if, and I believe the caller said like golfers who shoot like, you know, 40 to 45 on nine holes, which is like yep. still like, look, that's, 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 that's still so really good. good. Yeah. That's still go good golf for like, a, like so many players. And I don't want to downplay that by any means, because I, I think it's important that like, any golfer is always looking for performance, whatever they, whatever their score is, whatever their handicap is. So it's not like, oh, you have to do this or you have to do that. But when you are looking at someone like that, you know, one thing a lot of times, like maybe driver dispersion or dispersion with golf clubs, a lot of times you're going to get less spin access with those two or three piece golf balls that are the, that offer that like firmer non-urethane cover. And then when you get closer to the green, you're just looking at, to Chris's point, put these two things together, you're looking at what kind of consistency as far as shot shape am I going to do? Like, look, like there's not a lot of players in that category who are trying to hit like wicked flop shots that are going to spin a lot and stop. There are a lot of, most players are going to be using a gap wedge or a pitching wedge to try and pitch and run. So if you are able to control that and understand how far that golf ball is going to roll out every single time, not only are you going to 100% completely understand from a value perspective, what you're going to get out of that, but you're going to get that consistency and that performance on every single shot. So you get the value, you get the performance, and all of those things come together for those golfers in that category so they can be confident going out there. And they also don't feel like the pressure, because I get this, like, again, golf is an expensive sport. And sometimes I played high school golf, you know, you see the kid with like the expensive clubs and you see someone else over there and there's like, there's ego involved and all of those different things. Cause you know, there's again, money and budgets and all of that stuff. And so some player can feel just as confident in their equipment, whatever they're using, whatever price point they're using versus looking over at someone else and being like, Oh, they've got the new, this and the new that, and they're playing the, the $60 dozen golf balls. Like it doesn't matter. Cause it's the golf ball doesn't care what you're using. It just cares how you deliver the golf club. And so at that point it's get out there, be confident in what you're using. And I think, in, in most cases, from a coaching perspective, your goal is to instill confidence and inspire players to do their best. And if you can give them that confidence just from an equipment perspective, they're going to go out there and feel like, you know, no matter what I do, I'm going to be performing my best. And it's my job to just focus on my task at hand. I think you guys gave some great answers. Um, I, I will say I'm not made of, of golf gear, but... Uh, I do have a bunch of dozens, uh, dozens and dozens of golf balls around the house and I have your phone number. So I'll be reaching out and I'll send you, I, I can't, I can't supply a, a, a season's worth of golf balls, but I can definitely get you like 12 to 15 dozen. So, uh, that should hopefully get you started. So I'll, I'll be reaching out on the side to get you those golf balls. Uh, all right. With that, 
let's wrap up episode 231 of fully equipped as always if you want the gear goodness hit up the social channels we are at fully underscore equipped on twitter and at fully equipped golf on the youtube change (laughs) uh man it has been a night uh and then also on instagram so hit us up there if you have any questions Thanks as all for listening.